Hello and good morning, and welcome to this episode of Experimenta. Uh, I'm Nate from Imagine Science. I'm here with Heather Burnett. Uh, hi, Heather. Hi, how are you doing? Uh, so we're going to talk about Heather's work this morning. And of course, if you have any questions while you're tuning in, just uh, click the Q&A box in Google Plus, and you can ask them, and we'll see them. Uh, so Heather, um, thanks for joining us. And tell me a little bit about your work. OK, well, I'm an artist, a background in photography mainly, but I work with animation, film, installation, sculpture, a whole variety of media. Um, most of my work is connected to, inspired by, or working with science in some way, shape, or form. Um, so I work a lot with biological systems, imaging technologies, um, that kind of thing. Very good. Uh, and you specifically work a lot with slime molds. Yeah, I have an ongoing collaboration of sorts uh, with the intelligent organism Physarum polycephalum, which is a slime mold. Um, and for those who don't know the wonderful world of slime molds, it's a single-celled organism um, that that forms a mass supercell, um, so joins forces with other other single cells of its like, and um, and is has is attributed with primitive intelligence, problem-solving skills, memory. Um, which isn't bad for a little single-celled organism. And there's, there's a huge array of research uh, done with this one type of slime mold in particular. It's used as a model organism in a whole range of, of scientific and, and research, as well as uh, architecture, design, you name it. Everybody's asking different questions of this organism. Wow. So I remember I was fascinated with these things when I first heard about them as a child. And back then, I don't think we knew exactly what group they were, you know, even as broadly as kingdoms. So, but it seems like they're now grouped into several different areas. But the ones you work with, what, what are they exactly? Um, yeah, they've had a bit of an identity crisis in terms of classification. Um, they were attributed to the fungi kingdom um, because they, yes, some of their behaviors are, are, are like uh, fungi and lots of people who are working with fungi are interested in slime molds. Um, and then they uh, thought to be amoebozoa. Um, but they, yeah, they have their own kingdom, and they, they are somewhere between a, a fungus and a, an amoeba. <laughs> they have kind of amoeba properties. Wow. Uh, and so what? how do you collaborate with them, then? Um, well, I'm, I work in quite an empirical way. I was first given my, a, a pet slime mold by uh, a creative microbiologist friend, Dr. Simon Park, who does a lot of um, interdisciplinary work, and um, was told to go home and feed it oats and see what it did. And that was uh, four or five years ago. And, and I've been observing behaviors, growth patterns, um, trying to influence and manipulate its growth. In a way, trying to draw with it is, is a really kind of simplistic um, element, but I soon realized that it's, you know, it, it, it has its own in, kind of intention and motivation. So it's, it's a negotiation um, of sorts. But I, I, I grow it, give it things to do, um, so try to attract it in certain directions uh, with things that it likes or uh, repel it with things that it doesn't like um, so to, to generate um, and create moving image. So I, I shoot time lapse because um, it, its top speed is about a centimeter an hour. So for live viewing, it doesn't doesn't really make unless you're incredibly patient. Um, so I use time lapse and create animations. So what motivates a slime mold then? Sorry. Uh, what? How do you motivate a slime mold then? What are the things um, that it likes and dislikes? Okay, so motivating factors: it likes dark, damp, uh, which proves its own challenges for photography. And um, it tends to, its favorite food is porridge oats, though it also likes pasta and rice, so it's got a bit of carbohydrate fetish. Things it doesn't like, uh, salt, uh, light, dry air. Um, and I, I've done various experiments at a, 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 a photography festival a couple of years ago. I invited, I did a two-day time lapse at the festival and invited visitors to, to feed it, either things it liked or didn't like, and the poor slime mold got things thrown at it over a two-day period, and uh, chili powder and Alka-Seltzer and all sorts of things that it wasn't too keen on. And so what kind of drawings do you create with it then when once you've motivated it in one, some direction or another? Um, 
Um, there, I mean, there are lots of uh, videos on YouTube and of different studies. And to start with, it was it, you know it's really kind of seeing what what it did and how it grew and um, kind of getting a sense of of its behaviour and its its pattern. Um, and for a lot of that, I was drawing on some of the research, and we can I mean we can look at particular videos today if you like. There, there's some classic scientific experiments, um, the maze, for example, uh, where the slime mould identified the shortest route uh, through a maze to connect points of a food source. Um, another experiment that people may know of is the Tokyo transport system that they placed oats at the points of, of main uh, towns and intersections and the slime mould uh, created the most efficient network between these points and replicated a pretty close approximation of the actual transport system. So uh, they would think that they took that as confirmation that they'd done a good job and they had an efficient network. And wow. you know, so they're, you look, great. they're good at city planning then. They're, they're fantastic city planners, and you look on YouTube if you if you search for you know, slime mold maps, and you will find the Iberian Railway network, the U.S. highways, Canadian highways, U.K. motorways. You you name it, the slime mold has been asked to to navigate between it. Um, and now you know people have been comparing it to existing transport systems, but what's starting to happen now within with kind of, architectural designers and urban planners, they're, they're using it as a design principle rather than as a modelling backwards, which I think is really exciting. That, you know, sl the slime mould, a single-celled organism, is, is influential in, in designing uh, efficient kind of complex urban networks. Very interesting. Wow. So how do, you, how do, how do they actually transmit this information? Uh, what, how does this work, I guess? Okay, um, it's it's a really good question, and the definitive answers are not known. It's people, you know, where where can this intelligence lie? Um, it can solve mazes, it can solve problems, it can you know, it can anticipate events, and it has no organs, no brain. It is just a, a mass of cells working in, in cooperation. So there's just you know, millions of nuclei and a cell wall, um, and I mean I can show a video. Of some microscopic things. So if I screen share, yeah, that'd be great. Okay, so no, that one. Okay, have you got my screen? Uh, yes, but uh, and there it is. Very good. Okay, so I'll turn the music off for this one. But if I if I play this. Uh, so this is under a microscope looking at um, the, can, the ends of a, a small piece of slime mold, um, and I'll show I'll show a macro version so you've got uh, some context. Um, and can you see this particles streaming backwards and forwards within the cell? So it's oh, yeah. out, and this is sped up about ten times. So there's there's a streaming uh, rhythm it's, which is synchronous across the whole cell um, and it will trans transmit or transfer nutrients that it's picking up um, and yeah it, you know, that's its communication channel in a way so it will pick up I mean it's responding to its environment through chemotaxis so it will pick up chemical signals and it will manage to transmit information about where food is um, you know what the kind of conditions are what if, if the conditions are positive or negative and it will also transmit nutrients around the cell. So that's kind of how it's doing it. That's its brain, really, the, these veins with particles in it. And what are the particles that it's moving? So that's, that's nuclei and bits of nutrients that it's absorbing from, from its food source well. and cellular matter. And I remember uh, from my biology classes years ago, that the problem of the uh, the giant amoeba sort of organism is that it, it's hard to move stuff around very quickly, which, as you were saying, they can only move very slowly. So how does it how does it keep uh, resources distributed to survive um, like this as a giant cell? Well, I think the um, I mean you can see the the rhythmic um, pulsing. So yeah. this in it. 
in real time, it, the, the nutrients are moving in one direction for about a minute and a half. So it's sort of 90 seconds in one direction, and then it will flow in the other direction. Um, and that, that will pretty efficiently. There's it, it's this you know very regular rhythmic pattern within the cell that it keeps maintains um, nutrient. That's that's the end of that one. So um, I'll come back. Okay, you got me again. All right, thanks. No, that was amazing though. And yeah, you definitely could see all of those the ebb and flow of everything there. Um, maybe I should show you a more kind of real macro size one, actually, so you've got the comparison. So what you were looking yeah. at at the ends of, I can't multitask and press buttons and talk at the same time, it would appear. That's okay. <laughs> okay, so what you were looking at with the microscope are these ends um, where the energy is, where the slime mold is growing out. Um, and so this is a, a short animation that was made for the Edinburgh Science Festival. They had a, an exhibition on slime mold. So this is at the map of Edinburgh, mm -hmm. and the, 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 the hearts of the, the sites of the festival venues. So they wanted the, the slime mold to navigate between all the, the festival venues. Mm, much more efficiently than the festival goers, no doubt. No doubt, yes. Um, so that's... If you know, in terms of scale, you're looking at something that's about on the kind of wider shot, is maybe six inches across. And how long did you spend shooting to get all this time lapse? Um, probably about five days altogether, and then just yeah, cutting the close-ups together. But you can see here even that you can see that pulsing okay. um, within the veins, and then that's the end of that one. Um, and what were the hearts then, a food source, clearly then? Um, there might have been some hidden food underneath there. Oh, there might okay. have been the odd oat hiding. Hmm. Um, so if I fast forward. Okay, this is an interesting one. So this is one of the early ones of just observing. So it's, it's fed on, on the moat in the beginning. So you get a sense of scale. If you know how big a porridge oat, you can see what scale of what you're looking at is. But if I rewind, as it as it grows out, it recognises itself when it meets. So it's grown towards itself, essentially, so it's still connected as a single mass cell, and it already knows it's there, so it doesn't carry on. It retreats, comes back to the centre, and then grows in a completely different direction. So there's a sense of recognition, and you can also see it leaves a trail um, of where it's been. So it will leave a chemical signal behind so it knows it's been in that part of, of its environment um, and it will it will you know, kind of cover all that area and this is just an excerpt, it carries on afterwards and, and covers that area. And so if you were to add oats to the section where it had already been, it would know right away that they were there? Um, if you added oats, yes, it's, it's um, it will pick up where food is um, and and quite clearly sort of move towards food sources. Mm. I'm not sure, I can't say precisely at what distance it can sniff out, or not sniff, but you know, detect um, a note. Mm. Um, do you want to see some other stuff, or do you want to ask another uh, question? Yeah, these are great, actually. Just keep showing us some of your videos. OK, because these, these are some excerpts. So if I do, this is... Um, a maze. It's not an exact replica of the maze experiment, of, um, but it's it's the the scientific experiment filled a maze with slime mold and put two points of food, and it so it rationalised to the to the most efficient um, route between these two food points. Here it starts at one end and takes two directions, so it, it splits and then um, to to maximise its coverage and then grows towards the food. Um, this next one, um, several bits of slime mold were placed on a substrate uh, with some hidden food spelling out physerum um, and it locates and networks between 
between the food sources. If you have two different slime molds in the same area like this, do they become one, or do they know do they know that they're separate organisms and avoid each other, or? It depends on the species. There are some parasitic slime molds that pretend to be um, a, a like species and then consume the other slime mold. Um, others will just kind of navigate around each other and and pretty much ignore each other. Um, oh, this is this is a failed attempt at trying to get it to come back to life. I don't know how clearly you can see this, but this little green, this little yellow area here, is one one thing that's particular about its life cycle, is that it can either, if conditions aren't right, it will either grow into fruiting bodies um, and the spores be taken on the wind um, to better lands, or it will dry up into a scab, a sclerosis state, which can be reconstituted later. So, in, in, that was. Um, my attempt to reconstitute an, <laughs> a previous experiment after two years of lying dormant, but without much success. So I think there's a time limit on how long it can stay in its dormant state. Um, right. But you know, still pretty, pretty efficient uh, way to avoid dying. Much better than I could do. Yeah, I think. Yeah. <laughs> oh, this this is the um, likes and dislikes that everybody threw stuff with it. I can show you this one. Oh wow. Well. So over a period of a couple of days, people came and, and decorated it with all sorts of things. So those are the considered likes at the end of the experiment and the dislikes. Hmm, okay. And it was a bit ambivalent. We couldn't decide whether it liked spit and tobacco. <laughs> hmm. So where do these things? Li where do these occur in nature? Where, where would you see a slime mold in the wild? Okay, um, so its natural habitat is in woodland. So if you turn over rotten logs. It will, you, you might find slime molds uh, digesting the bacteria on the rotten vegetation. Yeah. Um, so yeah, wood, woodland. So it likes dark, damp um, woodland kind of areas. Very good. Um, well, uh, so yeah, your slime mold works amazing, but I know you do a lot of other things too. Could you tell us a little bit about those? Um, yeah, I mean, I, but I've worked with all sorts of... Actually, wait, sorry. Let me. I know you mentioned earlier the Slime Mold Collective, so we should oh, yeah. branch out a little yeah. bit into that before we move okay. on. So the Slime Mold Collective is an online... Um, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to show you it as well, rather than just talk about it. So I'll scroll oh, share it. Okay, so you should be able to see a web page. Yep. Coming through. Okay, so it's it's an online collective. It's on a, on a Ning network and also on Facebook. Um, and you know, I was I was interested when I first started getting into into slime molds and and discovering really varied research. Um, the teams in Australia looking at its decision making skills. Teams in Bristol looking at its biological computing capacity and working on biomorphic robots modeling Fizerum. You know, all these different people asking. <laughs> loads of questions and, and, and modeling and working with this organism in different ways. Um, and and, you know, and artists and designers interested in it as well. Um, I wanted to 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 see to, you know, to try and connect um, different people, so I set up this. And you know th th there are there are analogous properties between the slime mold as an emergent system. It's it's working on you know, agent localized agent based Behaviors. There's no kind of over, overarching intelligence or control, and you know other systems like the World Wide Web operate in a similar way. Hmm. Um, so I you know, just I started the collective, didn't really advertise, and just hoping that people would find it as they were googling. Um, and over the years, a, a small but dedicated membership. I think we've got a couple of hundred people um, who share what they're doing, ask each other questions, share tips, um, 
and, and yeah, share what they're doing. So if, any, if there are any slime mold enthusiasts out there, you're very welcome to join the Slime Mold Collective, uh, which is at slimeco.ning.com. Um, hmm. yeah, and yeah, it, it, people are just, just doing loads of really interesting things with it. What's the most amazing thing you've seen somebody else doing via the collective then? Um, well, I think the work that um, Andrew Adamatsky is doing um, in the Centre for Unconventional Computing um, down in Bristol at the University of West of England is really interesting. And there's a... He's written a book called Pfizer Machines, I think. See, oh. Pfizer Machines. So this is... Um, he's looking at the slime mold as a biological computer. Um, and doing lots of interesting work. I had some somebody just sent me something earlier today who's I can't remember where they're at, but they're doing their main architecture and they're using the slime mold to to help d design architecture. So using it as a kind of its three dimensional structures and um, modeling kind of efficient uh, tension and weight support um, and I mean, there's been loads of really interesting other urban planning also for the city efficiency network um, problems used with that. Wow. Um, actually, one other thing on slime mold. So have you tried working with any of the other species, um, like the ones that aren't all a single, new, uh, single like cell wall? Um, well, I've done the human slime mold experiment, oh. uh, which was a very tongue-in-cheek way to... To see, to, to get, to ask people to engage with what the organism does, with, you know, why slime molds are interesting. But by a comparison, um, you know, slime molds are highly efficient uh, at cooperation. They will cooperate really efficiently as a mass cell, um, and you know, quite sophisticated communication methods for, for such an organism. So we asked people. This is part of the bio design exhibition in Rotterdam last autumn, um, and as, as part of that exhibition, we ran a human slime mold experiment and I'll, I'll raise this on screen as well yes please because it kind of needs <laughs> it needs a visual hmm. so and I'll turn the volume down because it gets a bit raucous okay so can you see a bunch of people with yellow ropes around them absolutely okay. so people had to follow some simple slime mold rules um, let me start at the beginning. And this was in collaboration with some of you may know, because uh, it's very local to you, Dan Gruskin um, from GenSpace. Oh yeah, of course. Project that me and Dan worked on together. Um, and our old was, office was right downstairs from GenSpace. Sorry. Our, our old office was right downstairs from GenSpace. Oh right, okay. Yeah, I know. Um, I know the building. I've done a few, a few workshops there. Oh nice. Um, so we asked people if they could form an efficient network uh, tied together as a supercell. So we had to bind people so they, they operate as a, as a single mass cell. Um, so these yellow ropes you can clip and unclip and so change the shape. Hmm. Um, and we asked people to follow some oats. <laughs> so they were told that's, that's their food source. And they had to navigate around the building. Um, this is on the opening night, so people just had a few glasses of wine, and it was slightly chaotic. Um, but you know, it proved quite challenging for them. When they hit a, an obstacle, they had to move around it, or they had to sort of re renegotiate their environment as a mass. Um, so you know, going through small bottlenecks was quite challenging. Um, and then at the end, so then we, we, we made it more difficult each each time. Um, added additional food sources that they had to network between, um, and by the final phase, where is it here? They had to navigate between three food sources, three oats, um, and really have to work out how to how to make the most efficient shape possible. Um, they, they didn't do badly, but the slime mold would have done it far far more efficiently. And then the next day. In the park, we uh, invited a group of random strangers who had just happened to be passing by at the time to to perform some 
problem solving tasks of a similar nature. So navigating around obstacles, changing their shape, looking for nutrients in their environment. I mean, this time we, we used oats, but we also introduced some beer, which kind of helped in persuading people to take part in the experiment. Right. But I mean, one of the most interesting things about this is, you know, we, we, it, this wasn't a hypothesis-driven experiment. Um, you know, we weren't trying to prove something. We were trying to engage people with the principles of an organism by asking them to behave like that organism. You know, they weren't supposed to speak. They had to communicate through oscillations or vibrations. Um, they were told kind of what their motivations were and and how they, how they could behave. And, and these people were really game. They were up for it, which was fantastic. Uh, what you know, what happened at the end is, you know, we we had a kind of spontaneous symposium in the park, and people were talking about how they perceived what the experiment was about. So that's then finding their nutrients and sharing it out amongst the cell, sharing the beers. Yeah. Um, but the conversations, with one of these people was an urban planner, so talked about autonomy and agency in the city and how communities should take charge of their environment more. Someone was a psychologist and was really interested in the, the group dynamics and how people had behaved differently and how even, even when people were told to operate as a, as a mass cell, there's still leaders and followers. Someone else compared it to bacterial communication and quorum sensing. Um, so you just, yeah, you had these really you know, interesting conversations through a, a, a slightly ridiculous but also thought-provoking experiment. Yeah, it certainly seems like they have a lot of applications in different areas. Yeah. So what's next for slime mold for you then? Um, the, yeah, I'm, I'm carrying on work with it. I think I'm going to do some more stuff with the human slime mold. I'm interested in, in different groups um, of people and how, so potentially how, um, so trouble with the multitasking on the button person. Um, so I'm interested in the, this idea of nonverbal communication. So as a, as a kind of psychological or possibly even neurological possibility um, of building a. a uh, an assault course or a, a series of problems uh, for people to navigate as a mass cell. Um, but I mean, you know, com comparing, you know, would a group of dancers who are used to more kind of sensorial communication um, be more efficient than a group of very individualistic people? Um, would an would a orchestra be able to communicate better than a group of bankers? Or I don't know. Um, so that's one possibility. Um, I'm, I'm doing a TED talk uh, in June about the art and science of slime molds, and so that I, I'm, I want to really represent the whole range of you know talking about what the organism is and why it's interesting, but all the you know bring together different research. Um, so I'm very interested in hearing what people are doing. I mean I've got lots of uh, connections through the the slime moco slime mold collective, but if there are any other people who are doing amazing things with slime molds, I want to know about it. So I can include that in that. Um, and then, yeah, I've got other projects on the go. But the slime mold is the one that I keep coming back to. That's just kind of the long the long haul experiment because there's, there's, there's things I want to do with it. There's um, various combination experiments. So I want to screen print um, with, with food sources and see how, how delicate and how accurate it will, will replicate things, various experiments with three-dimensional structures. Um, its response to light. Um, so yes, it will continue. Many possibilities, clearly. Um, and what else are you working on then? I know you don't just work with slime mold though. No, um, I mean, I've, other organisms I've worked with, I've worked with cuttlefish and fruit flies and um, so a whole kind of range of size and complexity of organisms. Wow. Um, a lot of work with imaging technologies um, so I've worked with thermal imaging and CT scanning and a whole range of things. Um, other project I'm working on at the moment, which is very early days, so I'm not kind of I'm not quite sure what will happen. Um, I have I'm a, have a residency in a restaurant, um, and so we'll be working with food as material. Um, but I'm also interested in observing the the efficiency and again it's kind of efficiency and networking and movements. 
um, of groups of people. So within the kitchen and within the restaurant, I may do some sort of time and motion studies because um, I think there's yes, there's this kind of efficiency network thing going on there, but too, too early to say. Hmm. And how did that come about? Did they reach out to you or? Yeah, it was an invitation, um, which was really nice. Uh, they yeah they had seen. Work and I've done a lot of work. I've done a lot of residencies, and so the beauty of a residency is, um, when you're kind of embedded somewhere, is that you re you respond to that environment and that community, and and w what they're doing there uh, is it becomes your material. So it's a really nice blank canvas to start with, and each project is different, which as an artist is really really healthy because it stops you from getting into habits of, you know, stylistic habits or kind of replicating Absolutely. yourself. Um, so, what so, are your, some some of your other residency locations in the past? Then um, a whole range of things. I've worked a lot with with scientific laboratories and, and working with science groups. So um, that includes lots of life science groups. I've worked with. I did a project in uh, Sussex University, which worked with evolutionary biologists and uh, fruit fly geneticists and um, behavioural biologists. Um, and you know, kind of working between the, the groups. But I've also done things, I've worked in the botanical garden, um, working with plants, so I have I've worked a lot with sort of botanical material. I like working with live material because it's unpredictable and you have, you have to really negotiate it and understand it. Um, it. There are far more layers of complexity than working with paint or ink or, or digital media. Um, yeah. You know, you have to you have to really kind of understand what you're working with and, and, and work in a different kind of time frame. So you said that you got into slime molds because they were a gift, but how did you become interested in biological systems in art in the first place? It's a difficult one to answer. I think I, you know, as a child, I was always interested in how things worked. So I, I'd watch operations on TV, and um, you know, at one point I wanted to become a wildlife photographer. Um, uh, I wanted to become a doctor at one point, and uh, I was always interested in hey, how thing, how things worked, and and just that that appreciation of things that we take for granted. So, you know, watching an ant colony in in operation, just you know, looking at the the environment that we that we live in, um, and I you know I never really wanted to study science, so my interest is very much as a as a lay person from an arts basis. Um, but it's yeah, it's just something wanting to know kind of how how things work, as we all do. But yeah, that's yeah. and messing great. about with them, manipulating those things. So yeah, understanding a system to then explore it creatively. Right. Well, um, I think this has been really fascinating. But it's I've been like. A, Half an hour now. So, do you okay. want to say anything to wrap up or bring these things to a close? Um, no, I think that's cool. Um, mm -hmm. So, yeah, just if anybody out there is doing something interesting with slime molds, join Slime Moco um, and let me yeah. know about it because I'm, um, yeah, interested and in. And the URL for that, or I guess if you just look up Slime Mold Collective, that will be easy to find. There can't be too many of those. SlimeMoco.ning.com. Okay. Well, thank you very much, and thanks for sharing all your work with us. Okay, great. Cheers. And thank you, all of our viewers. Goodbye. Bye.